All right, you guys, looks like we're ready to go. Thanks for joining me tonight. Um, I will jump in uh, to my slides in just a second. Um, I'm also going to uh, hopefully leave some time to answer a few questions um, as we go through here. I'm going to mute everybody out and we're going to get rolling here. So uh, tonight we're going to talk about protein, one of the <laughs> most uh, common questions that I get is what is the best protein? Um, and it's not an easy, it's not an easy uh, 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 question to answer because you have to ask yourself a lot of different, um, you know, follow on questions. So, you know, if the first question is what's the best protein? The second question is for what? What are your goals? What do you want to use the protein for? And some of the things that go into the, that consideration are, do you want it for weight loss? Do you want it for muscle gain? Do you want it for appetite control? Do you want it for blood sugar balance? Do you want it for general nutrition? Um, how old are you? What is your gender? I mean, these are all very important considerations that go into answering the question of what is gonna be that, that best protein for, for a given individual. So I'm gonna try to answer these questions and I'm gonna try to give you um, some, some good reasons for why we use the kind of protein that we do um, in, our, in our GBX food line. Um, so keep in mind, we are a mental wellness company. And so obviously the kind of protein that we want to use is going to be something that fits in with our overall story. If we were a bodybuilding company and we didn't care about the mental wellness piece, it might be different. Our, you know, our, 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 you know, our check boxes for the kind of protein that we would choose might be different. If we were a sport nutrition company, it might be different. If we were a weight loss company, it might be different. But because we're a mental wellness company and our overall objective is to move people up this mental wellness continuum and help them feel better, then, you know, and, and if that's our, our primary focus in life, and it is, then that's going to inform a lot, of, a lot of the decisions that we're making around, around things like protein. Um, so, you know, the, the, the other consideration is that the way that we're doing the mental wellness piece is this. It's this, it's this three-tiered approach of biome, brain, and body. And they all don't just interact with each other, but they feed on each other. So this will also inform the kind of protein that we're using and the reasons that we're using it. Um, so so uh, let, me, let me get into a little bit of... Um, sort of nuts and bolts when it comes to protein nutrition uh, before I get into, into you know, some of those sort of hardcore recommendations. Uh, first off, there are a, a, a zillion um, guidelines in terms of selecting how much protein you need. And some of them are based on body weight. Some of them are based on amount of grams of protein you need. Um, there are always ranges that, you know, the ranges are, are, are based on your body weight and your gender and your goals and your activity patterns and things like that. So, you know, general, look at, look over here on the right hand side. In general, depending on the, 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 the guideline parameters that we're using, active people need more than sedentary people, right, to fuel that exercise and to fuel that muscle growth and maybe to fuel that weight loss. People who are trying to gain muscle need more than people who are you want to stay static right where they are. People who are trying to lose weight need more protein. So they're going to be higher on the recommended level than, than on the lower level. And older need more to, to maintain muscle mass. So I'm going to be 52 this year. I need a little bit more protein. And I have about the same activity patterns that I did when I was 42. Um, so I'm going to need a little bit more protein to maintain that same amount of muscle mass um, at the same activity patterns that I had a decade ago. Um, and, and that's gonna be important because if I wanna build a little bit of protein, uh, I'm gonna need a little bit more. If I'm gonna try to lose a little bit of weight and change my body composition, lean mass going up, fat mass going down, I'm gonna need a little bit more. Um, and I'm gonna need more you know, during an active phase of my training versus a, versus a recovery phase of my training. So those are some of the considerations that go into these protein target ranges. So you can see one of the biggest considerations is overall body size. Um, so that's gonna drive a lot of that. But then the range, you know, look at this. Even at, in this small, tiny person, 100 pound person, this 60 to 90 gram range of your target of an overall 24 hour intake of protein, that's a pretty wide range, right? Where, you know, you're talking about, you know, a factor of 
three times within that range. So the question kind of becomes, well, all right, if this is my range, do I take 60 or do I take 90? Or do I take some place in the middle there? Do I take 70 or 80? Well, that, you know, are you low on the range or high on the range is going to be determined by these things. If you have all of these going on, you're going to be higher. If you have none of those going on, you're going to be lower, right? So that's the, that's where the sort of gray area of being able to say to somebody, you, this one individual need X, right? It's always that X within a, within sort of a range. So you can see here how it, how it sort of grades up from there. My body weight is around in here, sort of in between the 150 to 175, I'm about, I'm about 160, 165, depending on the phase of my training. So my protein targets are always going to be right around, you know, 100-ish, right? That's about the middle range of here. It's the low range of here. That's usually what I'm targeting. Uh, sometimes a little bit more during a high intensity phase, sometimes a little bit less during a, during a lower intensity phase. But you can see that, right? That though, this to me, um, I wanted to put it up there so, to give people a frame of reference. But to me, this is not particularly useful. Um, you know, it, it, gives you a, it gives you a target out there in the world, but it doesn't really help you figure out how to structure your meals. It doesn't really tell you how to structure your, your strategy of eating or your, pr or your product selection or that sort of stuff, which is, which is really what people care about. You know, so we, we can use those as targets, but then we have to ask ourselves, all right, what am I actually going to eat? How am I going to get that protein into my body in a way that, it, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be assimilated the right way, right? Is it going to be digested pro appropriately? Is it going to be absorbed appropriately? Is it going to be delivered to the target tissues? Um, is it going to be retained in the body or is it just going to make me feel bloated and gassy, right? I mean, those are all considerations that I'm, that I'm going to get to in, in, uh, in, uh, in slides to come. But let's talk about foods first before we start talking about protein supplements. Um, what foods are high in protein? So these, are, these numbers are all based on um, a 100 gram serving. So 100 grams is going to be about three to four ounces, three and a half ounces uh, sort of on average. Um, and that is about, you know, most people can't say, oh, that looks like, you know, this mouse, that looks like three, uh, th three and a half ounces or 100 grams. Most people don't have that frame of reference. And so I like to give them this. If anyone's following the Project B3 program, the, the, the way that we educate people about their, their food quantity sizes is something that we call the helping hand, where you use your hand as a portion control device. Um, and the, 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 the protein portion of that is about the size of the palm of your hand. So, you know, you could, you, could weigh your, you could weigh your food if you wanted to, but you can also get pretty darn close by just saying, huh, every time I eat a protein, it needs to be about the size of the palm of my hand. You know, that's gonna be a medium-sized hamburger. It's gonna be a little filet mignon. It's gonna be two or three eggs, depending on the size of your hand. You know, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a medium-sized chicken breast, et cetera, et cetera. So here you can see when you make those selections of that particular food at that particular size, how much protein is there. So beef is gonna be the most dense source of protein, about 30 grams. Um, so, you know, if you're, let's, so let's go back, 30 grams. And if we go back here and we say that you're this 100 pound person and your target is around here, the 60 to 90 grams, you're going to need to do that two to three times a day in order to get your overall protein target. Um, and then based on how, how big you are, how intense you're going, what your goals are, if you need more protein, you're not going to be eating four hamburgers at one meal, you're going to be eating more often, right? And we talk about that kind of stuff when we talk about Project B3. You know, so here, where I am, just use myself as an example, if I'm in sort of this middle range where I'm taking around, a, you know, 100-ish, you know, and I'm doing hamburgers or steaks, if I'm going to try to hit 100, I have to do that four times a day, right? So I'm eating a protein source at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and sometimes else, right? A snack or before bed or something like that. So that's one of the things that we really encourage our athletes to do. It's one of the things that we really encourage our people who are losing weight to do is that they eat frequently like that 
Um, sometimes you can eat frequently within a within a compressed schedule. You know that that you know that you're still only eating within eight hours of a day, which is a which is a whole nother strategy. Um, but here are some of the other. So you guys get the get the point on that. It's not that you necessarily want to get more protein at each eating occasion or meal or snack. You just want to do that more often, stretched throughout the day. So here's where here's where your your beef is going to be. Chicken breast is usually a little bit less dense in terms of total protein uh, content. Fish is a little bit less than that, around 20 grams. Eggs, three eggs. You know, one egg is typically like a you know medium size to large egg is going to be around six grams of protein. Um, yogurt and milk uh, are are uh, confusing to people sometimes. Milk is actually a fairly decent source of protein, but it also has about the same amount of sugar with it. Um, you know, so you get a glass of milk, you're gonna get about eight grams of sugar and about eight grams of, of, of protein. That's a good trade-off actually. Um, and we can talk about why in a little bit. When you go to a yogurt, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basically dehydrated milk, right? It's concentrated milk. There's less, um, there's less sugar there, there's less liquid there. You have concentrated the protein source, which is primarily a protein called casein, which we're gonna talk about in just a little bit. But you're, you, know, you generally get, for the same volume of yogurt, you generally get about double the protein content, especially if you're choosing one of the denser ones, like a Greek yogurt, for example. And so that's why an eight ounce yogurt um, is gonna be more like 16. The thing to watch with yogurt, though, is to watch out, and I talked about this last night when I was talking about, um, uh, when we're doing our Project B3 uh, seminar. Um, one of the problems with yogurt is that it can be very, very high in sugar, added sugar. Um, and so you'll see yogurts that sometimes will be 16 grams of protein per eight ounce serving, but then you've got 30 or 32 or 34 grams of added sugar. And boy, those taste good. They taste like dessert, but that's as much sh uh, sugar as you're going to get in a soda. You know, so you definitely don't want to do that. I don't think most people would say, hey, let me get my protein and let me wash it down with a Mountain Dew. Um, that's not a good way to balance your nutrition, but that's exactly what you're doing when you're taking one of those sweetened yogurts. So um, there are some versions out there that have lower sugar. One that I actually like is one called Siggy's. I have no relationship with those guys whatsoever, but they do a good job of you know, putting enough sugar so it tastes good, but not so much that it's giving you that giant sugar bomb. What I generally will do though, is I'll buy plain yogurt um, that, that doesn't have any sugar in it at all. So you can get a good uh, uh, protein content plus phytonutrients and I, I, I'm sorry, um, probiotics, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit also. Um, but then you add your own. You will add your own sugar in the form of, you know, maple syrup or, you know, a, a little bit of jelly or some honey or something like that, because then you can control it. You can control how much you add to your taste and your nutrition goals. Uh, and then, you know, I don't want to leave out um, vegetarians uh, or vegans uh, or people who are just trying to cut back on their meat consumption. There, you can get plenty of protein from, um, from beans and lentils and nuts and seeds, um, but it's, it's sort of medium range, right? It's anywhere from 15 to 25 grams, you know, so sort of, you know, you can get, you can get a good amount, but you have to, you have to be strategic about it um, because these are also going to be higher in other stuff, um, uh, fibers and things like that, which are all good. Um, and, you, you know, some, if, you're, if you're doing beans, you have to plan ahead to cook them unless you're using canned and, you know, things like that. So there's all kinds of ways that you can, you can get the protein content from food. And that is what we always recommend, right? People have heard me say many, many times before, I'm a food first nutritionist. And even though I'm gonna be talking about supplements in a second, and supplements have a really important role, um, you really should try to get most of your protein content from these, from these high protein foods, okay? So the next consideration is we talked about total amount of protein we, in a day, we talked about sources of protein, food sources. On the next slide, we're going to start talking about protein supplement sources. But then the question becomes, when do you need it? And this is an important consideration that I think most people don't have a very, um, uh, a very clear um, appreciation for. Um, most Americans, at least, and that's pr primarily who's watching this video right now, don't need extra protein at dinner. We're doing a fine job of that, right? That's when most of us are eating the, the, the steak and the chicken and the you know, um, uh, salmon and things like that, right? So typically, 
our meals, if you look at, look at a day, what we tend to see is that we have protein, we have extra protein at dinner. We're actually eating more protein than our bodies require at that eating occasion, but we're protein deficient the rest of the day. And that's one of the reasons that I think supplements make so much sense for so many people. Um, if you were to maximize the benefits of protein, you wanna maximize your MPS, your muscle protein synthesis, meaning you eat your protein and it stimulates your body to make more muscle, that's an important consideration. If you want to maximize the appetite controlling, the fat burning, um, you know, the tissue rebuilding separate from muscle, um, any of those, you would want to dose your protein throughout the day. You wouldn't want to take it all in one meal at dinner time, like what most people do. And so the better thing to do would be to have less protein at dinner and spread out some of that protein throughout the, throughout the day. So here, when do you need your protein at breakfast? Yes. Exclamation point. At lunch, yes, exclamation point. At dinner, question mark, because most of us are, are getting enough there. We don't need any extra. Um, at snacks, yes, because remember, just in myself as an example, I need to eat that good amount of protein, 30-ish or so grams, um, um, at, at, at least three times a day, and then I'm still not getting it. So I need to have another eating occasion somewhere in there, and I've eaten my breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The next eating occasion would be a snack somewhere, you know, so it, somewhere in there, uh, or maybe two snacks somewhere in there, right? So snacks, definitely, you need to do that. Um, before, during, and after your workouts, exclamation point, absolutely. And then especially if you're an athlete, especially if you're trying to lose weight, before bed, exclamation point. So we, we need our protein at all of these opportunities to consume, except probably around dinner. Um, so, um, if you look at that from a meal by meal dosing perspective, um, one thing I want to get across is that the dose of protein really matters. Um, what you don't want to do is just think that more protein is better. Uh, more protein is better up to a point where, you know, less protein is not going to do the job. A medium amount of protein is probably going to do what you need it to do. Excessive levels of protein aren't going to make you have more muscle or lose more fat. They will probably just make you more gassy and more bloated and more, you know, just feeling gross. They're not going to do anything for the reasons that you're taking the protein. And so here I've got three sort of cut points here. You want to keep your protein intake at each of these eating occasions less than 40 grams. There's no additional increase in fat loss or muscle protein synthesis um, at above 40 grams. So 41 grams is, is the same as 40 grams. 50 grams is the same as 40 grams. 60 grams is the same as 40 grams, right? So 40 grams is where, you know, you can, you can draw a graph sort of of how much stimulation of fat loss, how much stimulation of muscle gain, and it really plateaus out and doesn't go any higher right around the sort of 35 to 40, right? So then the question becomes at that inflection point, at that point where it starts to, you know, it doesn't go up anymore, it starts to flatten out, then, then, the, then the argument becomes right at that curve is 15, or is, is 30 better than 25? Is 25 better than 20? Is 20 better than 15? And here, we have some pretty good data to, to answer that question for people. At 15 to 20, that per eating occasion, at your breakfast, at your lunch, at your snack, at your workout, right before bed, that seems to be the sweet spot if your main goal is to encourage fat loss. A little bit higher than that, at 20 to 30 grams, seems to be the sweet spot for encouraging muscle gain. Um, so what if you want to do both of those, which is what most people are going to want to do. Um, it's, 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 it, it's typically artificial for us to say, well, I only want to lose fat or I only want to gain muscle. What most people want to do is change their body composition by dialing both of those at the same time. You want to dial your muscle up and you want to dial your fat down, even if it's only by you know, a pound or a pound or five pounds and five pounds. That can make a massive difference in how you look and how you feel and how you perform. And so that's what most people are going to do. So right in the middle there, 15 to 20 
and 20 to 30 would be sort of 17, right? Keep that number in your head for a minute because that's exactly the amount of protein that we have per serving in our GBX protein, right? People will sometimes look at that and go, 17 grams of protein. Well, that's a weird number. Why did you come up with 17? Why didn't you do 15? Why didn't you do 20? Why didn't you do some round number? Why did you do this weird 17? It's because of this. It's because of the science. It's because of where we think the, our predominant user is going to want to gravitate towards. It, uh, so again, what I said at the beginning, if our predominant user was a sports nutrition person or, or a bodybuilder, we might have gone with a completely different kind of protein. We might have not even done a plant protein in the first place, like, like, like what we did. Okay, so that sort of sets up wh like why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll come back to these sort of recommendations. So um, what we want people to do, and this is how a lot of people get the best benefits from the usage of their GBX protein, they make a breakfast smoothie. This is exactly what I did today. I'm here at the home office in Southern California. I'm staying in a hotel. I have a nice buffet at my hotel. Um, but, you know, and it's eggs, which is a good source of protein, and it's waffles, which is a terrible source of protein, and it's bacon, and, you know, that isn't what I was in the mood for this morning. I came into the office, made up a smoothie, uh, got to have my berries, got to have my spinach, got to have my seed fiber, and my superfood, and my chocolate protein, all in the, in the same thing, mixed up with almond milk. Lovely. I sat and I read some scientific papers while I drank a milkshake, right? That's a pretty good way to start the morning, uh, and I was able to get you know, my 17 grams or so at breakfast. Um, you could do the same thing at lunch. You could do the same thing for a snack. Um, I, I didn't work out today because it's been a really busy day here at the office, but typically the way that I'll use this is that I'll, is I'll make up my smoothie and I'll start sipping on it on the way to the gym. So before my workout, I'll continue sipping on it during my workout. And then if there's any of it left when I finish my weight workout, I just, I just finish it off then. Having it around your workout takes the, the, this muscle protein synthesis and amps it above and beyond just the delivery of protein. Because what you end up doing is, let's say we're doing a bicep curl. Now you're stimulating that tissue to grow. You're increasing blood flow to that tissue. And now that you're taking the protein into your body, it's being preferentially delivered to that tissue and utilized by that target tissue. And so you get um, a, 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 an increment of muscle protein synthesis above and beyond that. Uh, same thing happens for fat loss. Same thing happens for, for appetite control. So if you're going to take your protein uh, and you have to decide the best place to take it, it's any of these places that have exclamation points. The other place where it would be really beneficial is before bed. Sometimes I'll do this, especially in a hard phase of my training, um, as a way to help me recover. Uh, and we'll, 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 we'll come back to this idea in just a little bit. Uh, but taking, a, taking this before bed is like a snack, right? Again, like milkshake, sort of a you know, delicious, sweet, creamy, cold kind of a treat at night before you go to bed. Now, while you sleep, this is when your body is making its growth hormone overnight. This is when you're able to repair all those little niggling, uh, uh, persistent aches and pains and tendons and ligaments and tissue damage and things like that that you induced on yourself in, during the day. So before bed is another really, really good place to do it. So once you do that, you're like, oh, you know, a few grams here, a few grams there, a few grams there, chicken breast there, uh, a, a, a steak there, handful of nuts there. You can see that you pretty quickly will get up to that 100, 120, 150 target that you might have that I, that I shared with you before, okay? Um, so there, that's sort, of the, that's sort of the strategy of how you're gonna do this. And then the question becomes, well, what protein supplement is best, right? To actually get to the question that I asked at the very top and the whole topic of this webinar tonight, here are the different types of protein supplements. And I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this particular slide. Um, and let me just go back up here real quick. I'm getting just a little bit of background noise. So I'm gonna see if I can, um, I wanna see, uh oh, I don't wanna do that. I wanna see if I can just go back up and hit the, hit the mute button for everybody. 
Um, it seems like there's a little bit of background noise that I'm getting. I don't know if everybody else is getting it, but there, I think we did it. Okay, so the different types of protein supplements. Uh, people who, who know what we've done here at Amari already know that we've, that we've, that we've done this. We've, we've landed on a, a, a product that's primarily chickpea protein, right? So that's the spoiler alert. But we did that um, after considering all the benefits, well, all the benefits and drawbacks, all the pros and cons of the other sources of protein that are out there. So um, before I get into the attributes of the different proteins, let me go over here to the right-hand side for these bullet points. When you're choosing a protein source, there is all, from, from a supplement perspective, there is always um, a trade-off between taste and performance, right? Everybody wants it to taste good and everybody wants to, it to do what you want it to do, um, whether it's fat loss or appetite control or muscle gaining or any of those sorts of things, okay? So, you know, is it gonna be gritty? That may or may not be acceptable to some people. You know, there are, uh, there's a category of protein supplements out there that are, um, you know, uh, plant proteins uh, like this, like, like yellow pea or brown rice or hemp that taste terrible. They, 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 they taste like sand in your glass. Um, but people who buy those, maybe will, maybe that's, a, that's, a, that's an acceptable trade-off because what they're getting is a general protein supplement that is plant-based, um, that fills their need to consume more plant-based things, right? And, and if that's what they're doing, that might be an appropriate trade-off for them. Um, Sometimes there's an organic taste, right? It's not just gritty, but things like brown rice, for example, and hemp, they can just taste sort of organic, like almost like muddy, dirty in your mouth. And again, if all you want is a plant source, uh, maybe that's, a, maybe that's a, an adequate trade-off for that, for that user. Some people want it to taste creamy. And if you want a creamy whey or casein, might be the way to go, right? They're dairy proteins, right? Dairy tends to have a creamy mouthfeel or what we call organoleptics. Um, and so if you want something that's creamy, maybe you'll, maybe the trade-off is you're gonna do a, you're gonna do a dairy protein with the, with the side effects of, 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 of something like that. Um, some of these will cause bloating and gas. I have bodybuilder friends who do a lot of egg protein or um, sometimes just, uh, you know, egg white, you know, the liquid egg white things uh, ultra pasteurized egg whites, and they're getting lots of protein, but their trade-off is that they are some of the gassiest, smelliest, uncomfortable people to be around, right? They're uncomfortable because they're bloated. You're uncomfortable because they're gassy, right? And that, that's the trade-off that they're making. Um, one trade-off I will spend a, a, a bit of time on tonight is the gut health piece. Um, when you're eating more protein, you're generally eating less carbohydrates. And when you're eating less carbohydrates, you're generally um, eating less and maybe actively restricting your intake of fruits and vegetables. That's a problem. Um, it's a problem because the extra protein, depending on the type you're taking, um, is gonna set up um, more bad bacteria. That's a simple way to say it, but that gets the point across. More protein, it, it, especially if you're eating more eggs or more fish or more dairy or more, especially more red meat, more beef, more pork, um, you're growing bad bacteria. You're damaging your microbiome in a, in, a, in a certain sense, okay? If you can get more plant proteins, if you can get more of the, the right kinds of fibers, you're growing good bacteria, right? You're doing something healthy for your microbiome. Because of, of Amari being a mental wellness company, and our approach to mental wellness being so much through the microbiome and the, and, the, and, the, and the gut and the second brain and the gut brain axis, this is a big deal for us. We don't wanna do anything that's gonna damage your gut health. We don't wanna do anything that's gonna change your microbiome in an adverse manner. And so um, this is one of the reasons that we gravitated to not a dairy protein and more to a plant protein and then specifically directly to a chickpea protein. And I'll get into, the, into the, the details of that in a second. But gut health is really, really important. And protein isn't necessarily the best way to improve your gut health. We still need protein, but can we give protein the right amount, 
the right dosage throughout the day, but in a way that accentuates or improves or maximizes gut health, yes, we can. Um, so that brings us to the question of two of the most popular eating styles out there, keto diets and paleo diets. Keto diets tend to be low carb and high fat. Paleo diets tend to be low carb and high protein. And so neither of these, high fat or high protein, is particularly good for your microbiome or particularly good for your gut integrity or particularly good for signaling across your gut brain axis. Um, so, you know, it's the, you know, fat is, fat can be bad, protein can be bad, or they can be sort of neutral if they're done the right way. Carbs are good for your microbiome and not all carbs, right? One of the things that is good about both of these diets is that you're eating low processed food. You're eating low sugar. You're eating low crap. And that's awesome. But uh, very often what you're also doing is you're not getting a lot of fruits and vegetables, right? Because these are so low carb, very often less than 50 grams a day. It's really, really difficult for people uh, following those diets to get in enough of the fibers that grow the good bacteria, right? I get it that if you're, if you're following keto, you're following paleo, um, you, you don't even want to hear me talk about whole grain, uh, um, um, uh, well, you know, whole grain breads or whole grain cereals or oatmeals or any of that kind of stuff because they're too high in carbohydrate. They're also good in prebiotic fibers, but those particular foods might just be too high in carbohydrates for you to even consider within the eating pattern that you're doing. Fine. Those are off the table. But what should still be on the table is low carbohydrate, high fiber vegetables, and then fruits we can have a discussion about, right? I don't think the fruits um, are, are, are necessarily going to be the problem that a lot of keto people or paleo people think that they are. But what, that they, what they do do or will do is feed your good bacteria. If you're neglecting this piece of it and just eating all the fat in sight or all the protein in sight, you're damaging your microbiome. You're making your gut more inflamed. You're sending the wrong sorts of mood, motivation, focus signals to the brain in your head. And you might feel great on these kinds of programs early as you're losing fat and there, there are reasons for that. But over time, the damage to your microbiome and the damage to your gut will catch up with you. Um, so that isn't, I'm not telling people to get off of these plans. If they're working for you, absolutely stay on them. But consider, is, could there be a way that you could take a low carbohydrate source that also improves your gut health and you can. That's what I'm leading up to. That you know the kinds of protein recommendations that I'm going to make in just a little bit, and the other supplementation recommend recommendations that I'm going to make, are perfectly appropriate for people who are in these situations, and not just perfectly appropriate, um, are almost necessary because they're not getting the nourishment of their microbiome that they really, really need for long-term health and well-being. Okay, so. I'm going to move from, from the right-hand side of the slide to the left-hand side of the slide, talk about these different, these different um, um, uh, protein supplement sources, right? So think about eggs. Eggs are sort of the standard, right? They have the best biological value. They have the best amino acid profile. Eggs are a wonderful source of, of, of protein. Um, think, about, think about the movie Rocky, right? He was cracking them into a glass, drinking them down. Don't ever try that. It's the most disgusting thing you will ever do. I've tried it before just so I can say that I did it. Not recommended. Um, it, salmonella aside. Um, but, you know, like I said, there are, there are protein, uh, powdered protein sources out there that are based on egg protein lovely source. Um, there are a lot of bodybuilders will use the, you know, the pasteurized sort of egg beater style things. And they'll, you know, they'll use a lot of those, but you have the side effects of gas and bloating and things like that. So, you know, we weren't going to go there. Um, fish, there actually are fish protein powders that are based on salmon and anchovies and um, uh, uh, what's the other fish I'm trying to think of? Uh, sardines. Um, and they, are, they taste like fish, just like you would imagine. They're, they're, they're yucky. I've, I've tried to develop a product around salmon, powdered salmon protein, and it is just not a good experience for anybody. So, you know, eat your, eat your fish, eat your salmon, eat your cod, eat your haddock, um, eat your mackerel and your bluefish and your tuna. 
that's, that's the place to get that. Um, dairy is probably the, the biggest category of protein supplements out, out there. Uh, and there are generally two types. Um, there are casein supplements, which is one of the, one of the primary proteins in, in dairy. The other primary protein is whey. Casein has benefits in that it's a slowly digested protein. Um, so you could take a dose of casein. What it ends up doing once it hits your stomach is it kind of curdles um, and it makes it something that is really hard for the body to break down, but you can use that as an attribute. A lot of people use a casein supplement at night because it gives a slow drip of amino acids into the bloodstream. And so you'll use that at night so that you're getting a little bit of that sort of um, ability to recover um, and you know, help with your ligament healing and your tendon healing and that kind of stuff. So that can sometimes be a, a, be a good use of casein-based protein powders. Um, they don't generally taste good. Casein can sometimes be very bitter. And so you have to you know, sugar it up or mask it with, with, with other things. Um, the, the real downside of casein is that if you're gonna be allergic to dairy, it's gonna be because of the casein. Uh, my own kids, for example, um, are allergic to casein. And so they don't take yogurt, they don't take milk, they rarely take ice cream. And if they do take ice cream, it's you know, typically a dairy-free sort of a thing. So casein is probably the, like, the big allergenic aspect of dairy. Um, so, so there, pros and cons. Whey is really what dominates the protein category. Um, there's, there's, there's whey protein supplements for weight loss. There's whey protein supplements for, for muscle building. There's whey protein supplements for general nutrition, for appetite control, for everything. Whey is where, where the majority of the supplement market is. Um, and the, and there's, a, there's reasons for that, right? Whey generally tastes really, really good. You can get a creamy mouthfeel with whey and you can get something that really has a, has a nice consistency in the mouth and pe people like it. Um, whey generally, if it's processed appropriately, um, tastes pretty darn good, right? Not only is it creamy, it's not very bitter, it's not gritty, it, it, ha it has all the attributes that you want. There's a lot of cheap, junky whey on the market, and these are gonna be the, you know, the cheap products on the shelf at your grocery store that do taste very bitter. And as a result of that, the company starts with a bitter whey protein that probably is a little bit denatured. The protein structure has changed. So that, that, that's problematic for two reasons. The first reason is that it doesn't taste good. And so in order to make it palatable to the consumer, you have to put a lot of sugar or a lot of artificial sweeteners or a lot of artificial flavors or a lot of fillers to mask all that bitter yuckiness, right? So that's the first piece that is not acceptable to us. Um, the other piece that's not acceptable to us is that if you have a denatured protein that's cheap, and the reason it got denatured is because it was, it was extracted quickly under high heat, the body's not going to assimilate that very well. So on your label, you might have 20 grams but the body won't be able to use that 20 grams. The body will probably absorb it and then look at it and go, something's wrong with that. That protein doesn't look right. Let's get rid of it, right? It's, it's, it, it's spoiled in a, certain, in a certain sense, right? So pros and cons with whey. We could have done a, um, a whey-based protein that tasted good, that was assimilated well, um, that, you know, that had all the attributes that we would want, but we would still have the problem of it being an animal protein. And where a lot of our, our customers want to go is more plant-based, right? For, for certain reasons, right? So, so we decided we wanted to go plant instead of, instead of whey. Um, the other reason that, um, so the one, let me be honest with everybody. The one place where whey is better than any of the plant proteins is that if your one goal, one goal in life, was to specifically enhance muscle building, whey is better than any of the plant sources. And it probably has, it doesn't have anything to do with, it's not the amino acid profile, it's not its biological value, it's not how it's absorbed. There's something about dairy and there's something about whey specifically where your muscles grow more. It could be because it's coming from a thousand pound animal 
and, and there's some sort of a growth factor in there that, that, that your body recognizes and you grow more muscle, but, but that's it. So what I'll generally tell people is that if your one goal in life is to gain more muscle on your body, then take away protein. Take away protein, take it right around the time that you're in the gym lifting weights, and you're going to get a really good effect. Um, but I think most people, at least most people that are attracted to Amare, um, have other goals in life. You know, that might be one of their goals. And by all means, go and get a good whey protein somewhere else and use that during your workouts. But please use our protein, the GBX protein, for the rest of your life at your breakfast, at your snacks, before your bed, you know, all those sorts of things, but use that whey protein right around the time of your workout, okay? Um, I don't do that. I have other, other needs, right? So I don't use a separate whey protein typically. Um, I will just use, I'll use our chickpea protein at all those different time points. Okay, so we made the decision. We want to go with plant. Um, which plant protein are we going to choose? I already said most of them suffer from this, being gritty, being organic, not um, um, delivering that creamy mouthfeel that everybody wants. And so that's what you see with soy. That's what you see with yellow pea. That's what you see with brown rice. That's what you see with hemp. You do not see that with chickpea. And it's it, with the specific chickpea that we're using. And the main reason for that, the main reason that all of these give you that gritty consistency is the way they're extracted. They're extracted in such a way uh, quickly under high heat that they deliver these particle sizes that are non-uniform meaning you'll have some large particles, some medium particles, some small particles. And the mouth senses that, perceives that as grittiness. And no amount of adding emulsifiers or thickening agents or fillers or sweeteners or flavors is gonna mask that. And people realize this, they'll, get a, they'll go buy a plant protein, and uh, even if it's a blended plant protein, and they'll drink it, and they'll just go, yeah, it's kind of, it tastes like there's sand in my smoothie. And that's not a good experience for people. So we didn't want to do soy. Um, soy has some benefits, right? It comes along with, you can actually get a really good protein content if your soy is extracted the right way. Um, you also, it comes along with, um, you know, uh, phytonutrients, um, phytoestrogens, um, compounds that can help your body modulate hot flashes and um, uh, menstrual swings and things like that. Um, antioxidant benefits of it, anti-inflammatory benefits of it. But soy is not, soy has some uh, uh, particular uh, um, off flavors that are, that are very hard to mask, right? It's almost like weird aftertastes um, that, are, that are difficult to get around. So we didn't want to do soy. Um, we also didn't want to do primarily pea or rice or hemp because of the grittiness that, that is associated with those. So we, we gravitated towards a chickpea. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the, the specific chickpea in just, a, in just a moment. One reason we chose the chickpea is because it comes along with, in, in addition to all the amino acids that we're getting, in the ratios that we're getting to do the muscle building and the fat loss and the appetite control, the reasons you want the protein in the first place. It also comes along with these compounds called oligosaccharides. Those oligosaccharides are fibers and they're specific type of fiber that we refer to as a prebiotic fiber. That prebiotic fiber is gonna nourish the microbiome, right? So you guys get the idea of why is that that's so important. I just spent, I don't know, 20 minutes talking about it, why it's so important for, for, for gut health and why a lot of people are, 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 are missing out on that when you're focusing too much on just the protein piece of it. So um, I have a couple of slides here talking about the importance of gut integrity and maintaining a good gut barrier function. Part of it has to do with the microbiome specifically, good bacteria versus bad bacteria. Um, if we're focusing too much on protein, too much protein is gonna grow inflammatory bad bacteria. And if we're not focusing on the fibers, the, the, the oligosaccharides, the prebiotic fibers, we're not growing enough of the good bacteria. So this is a way, chickpea is a way to sort of split the difference and have an anti-inflammatory effect and a, and a microbiome nourishing effect. There's three considerations when we're talking about the gut. One of them is the bacteria, the microbiome. The other one is the inflammation level or the pH level in the gut. 
and the other one is the actual integrity of the tissue of the gut, what we call the barrier function. So um, here you're looking at barrier function. Um, here, uh, one of the, one of the um, important considerations is the, is the mucus layer. Um, these oligosaccharides will not just feed the microbiome, encouraging the growth of the good bacteria. They will encourage the thickening of the mucus layer. A thicker mucus layer does a couple of things. It protects the lining of your intestine from anything that's in the lumen of the intestine, anything that you eat. So it's not causing damage, it's not causing inflammation. That mucus layer will also serve as a home for bacteria that is associated with good metabolism. So bacteria like, like one in particular called acromancia that we've measured in our fundamentals trials and we've shown that people who supplement with the fundamentals have more acromancia, that means more mucus lining, that means better overall metabolism, better ability to digest your food, absorb the right nutrients, um, um, be, be, be less likely to store fat, more likely to burn fat, better blood sugar control, all those sorts of things stem from those three aspects of what's happening in your gut, your microbiome level, your gut integrity, your gut inflammation. Um, and so really, really important to make sure that you get the right gut integrity in order to you know, get the benefits of gut-brain access. What are some of the things that can interfere with that? Well, Western diet, right? The standard American diet that's high in fat, high in sugar, low in fibers, that is gonna be a big, big problem. And I've done whole deep dives about you know, Mediterranean diet and mental wellness diet and, and standard American diet, which the initials of that are SAD, SAD. Um, so so I, you know, I won't go too much more into that th th than to say your diet is gonna, is gonna be a huge um, a factor in, in w whether your gut is, is in good integrity or if it's disrupted. Your stress levels, right? Anything that we perceive here in the brain is transmitted right down to the gut. And so if we have a lot of stress or a lot of sleep loss or a lot of ex you know, stressful exposure to our environment, that's going to disrupt gut barrier function. Um, and, then, and then lots of drugs. Um, there was a study that came out just about a year ago that showed that it's not just antibiotics that interfere with microbiome metabolism and disrupt gut barrier function. It's virtually all um, uh, drugs. Chiefly, it's going to be antibiotics and it's going to be pain drugs. Um, so um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, aspirins, ibuprofens, Tylenols, um, you know, uh, um, uh, Advils and those sorts of things uh, are going to be really, really hard on the gut. Um, so, so those are, those are, I mean, very predominant in our, in our society. Um, so if, if, if you have those sorts of things, you end up getting intestinal permeability. Sometimes we'll refer to this as leaky gut, where things in the, things in the lumen of the small intestine or, um, um, or, 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 or large intestine, either way we're looking at this, can leak across into the bloodstream. That's gonna set off an inflammatory reaction. That's gonna set off um, uh, an immune system reaction. This idea of leaky gut, I've talked in depth about during our Project B3 seminars, um, especially if you wanna go back and revisit that, um, look at the seminars where we talk about body, brain, biome. It's, it, it, um, in this particular offering of Project B3 that, we did, that, 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 that we're doing for May and June, it's session two. Um, so that's posted on Facebook. It's posted on YouTube. It's posted on my blog site, seantalbot.com. If you have leaky gut, if you have intestinal permeability where things are getting through from the intestines into the bloodstream, you're going to have a really, really hard time gaining muscle or losing weight. You're going to be stuck. Even if you do a good diet, you do a good exercise regimen, you adhere to the program, if your gut is not in good integrity, you're going to have a big obstacle metabolically to your ability to lose fat and gain muscle and change your body composition. So I, can, I, I, I really cannot emphasize that enough, how important that is for you to have a good gut in order for your diet and exercise and stress management, all the other things that we talk about in Project B3 to really gain traction, okay? Um, if this gets really bad, that can actually lead to a wide, wide range of, of, of chronic conditions, right? That are, that, are, that are even worse 
than you, you know, having a pot belly or even worse than you not being able to fit into your dress for the high school reunion that's coming up, right? These are all big deals. There are some that are, that are confined to the gut and there are some that are systemic autoimmune system kinds of problems. So, you know, if you're not doing it for how you look, muscle and fat, then at least do it for how, how, what your health is and how you feel, right? These are all very, very important considerations uh, for, for, you know, for, us, for us to be aware of. Um, and so then the question becomes, well, you know, we know it's important. We know some of the things that lead us in the wrong direction. And what are some of the things that can lead us in the right direction? How can we nourish the microbiome? How we, can we protect a good microbiome once we grow it? How can we protect the integrity of that tissue once we restore good gut uh, uh, integrity? Um, so, so some of it is dietary fiber. That's why I spoke as long as I did about the fact that people who are not getting fiber need to get the fiber because this is going to be the key way that we maintain that, that gut integrity. And we can supplement with the right probiotic bacteria. We can supplement with the right prebiotic fibers. We can supplement with the right phytonutrients to help protect the, 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 the acid base balance and the, you know, the pH levels and the level of inflammation and things like that. And we do all of that with the Amari supplements. Okay. So, um, and here's some example of that, right? So um, as we get into, just before we get into talking about um, our protein product in, in detail, I want to, I want to set it up uh, uh, about like, here's something you can do to improve that gut function. Um, we've done this with our Amari clinical trial. This is available now to everybody to download. Um, this is a snapshot of it on our website, amari.com in the resources section. We have got, um, we've got overview PDFs where, you know, if you just want to have the highlights, you can download that PDF and get the highlights of who we studied, how we studied them, what the measurements were. Um, and we've presented those data at, six different scientific conferences over the course of 2018. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we finally got our peer-reviewed scientific publication um, in a journal called Functional Foods for Health and Disease. So you can go to their website right now. Um, it's, the, it's, the, it's the current issue of the journal. You can find the paper, you can click on it, you can download the PDF, you can read all the gory details about who we analyzed and you know, um, you know what the discussion section looks like and all that kind of stuff. But the, but the moral of the story is that if you supplement the right way, the right probiotics, the right prebiotic fibers, the right phytonutrients, what we call phytobiotics, the right gut motility enhancers to move the food through your digestive system so that you don't get the gas and bloating and things like that, this is what you're gonna end up seeing. You're gonna see a much better microbiome and you're gonna feel much better. Why is that important for someone who's interested in a protein supplement? If you're interested in a protein supplement, you're probably interested because you're trying to lose weight or you're trying to gain muscle, you're trying to be more physically active, you're trying to get healthier. All of those are things that need better mental state. You need less stress, so you have less stress eating. You need a better mood, so you're more inclined to eat better. You need better energy levels so you can go and you can do your thing at the gym. You need to have better motivation so that you, so that you can you know, ad adhere to the overall program that you want and you don't get to the end of the day and your willpower is depleted and you just dive right into the bag of chips, right? So you know, the, the, everything that we do here is trying to get you to feel better so you can use that feel better to, uh, to, to, to maximize the other aspects of your life. Um, and the way that we do that is through gut health and through microbiome modulation and through signaling through the gut brain axis, right? So I thought it was important to say a piece of that. These fibers are, 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 are zero carbohydrates, right? So people who are on a low carb diet and say they don't have the room to fit in the fruits and vegetables to, you know, to, 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 to get your fiber, I get it but at least you could do this, right? I still want you to eat your fruits and vegetables, but at least you could do this. These are the fibers that we have in, in our mentobiotics. These are gonna be enough to grow the microbiome that you want. They're gonna be enough to improve the gut integrity that you want. They're gonna be enough to increase the mucus lining that you want. They're gonna be enough to lower the inflammation in your gut that you want, all of which is gonna be good for your overall metabolism, all of which is gonna make your protein 
gain more traction in doing the things you want a protein to do. Okay, so these are the prebiotic fibers that we use. These are the phytobiotic nutrients that we use. You can see that these have benefits for gut health. They have benefits for inflammation. They have benefits for blood flow. They have benefits for psychological vigor, which basically is your motivation to go to the gym and eat right anyway. You know, so, so these are going to be important too. So we're setting the stage for um, why we, like what, what, what are the different attributes of protein? Um, why do you care about gut health? Um, why you want a particular protein to do certain things so that I can get to this point and I can tell you based on all of that, this is what we did. So here's our GBX protein. We've got a chocolate and a vanilla. Um, the, it is very, very clean label, right? One of the things that you'll notice about our protein is that we're not using artificial flavors, artificial sweeteners like most protein products do. Um, we still have a sugar-free version, so you're not getting a carbohydrate load. Um, you're getting that 17 grams of plant protein, but it's coming with the oligosaccharides to give those gut health benefits. Um, and, you know, a very, very clean label before we even get into the discussion of the attributes. So 17 grams. I explained to you before why 17 grams, because it's right in that sweet spot between fat loss and muscle gain. And because most of our users are going to want a balanced delivery of both of those, right? So that's why we gravitate towards that number. I explained to you why we use plant versus dairy whey or any of the other plant sources. And I explained to you why we use chickpea versus, um, versus predominantly any of the other plant sources, right? Because of, because of the creamy consistency. Um, but we also did, and I'll, and I'll get into this when I, when I, um, when I get through it, uh, when I get to the particular slide, we did put in a little bit of um, brown rice and pea protein. And we did that to round out the amino acid profile of the chickpea protein. Um, and the reason we did that is because we want to make sure that the protein is functionally delivering what people want a protein to do. If we get the right amino acid profile, we can do this. We can deliver appetite control. We can deliver muscle mass building. We can deliver fat loss, all the, all the metabolic reasons that you want. Um, uh, and, then, and, then the, and then the other, other attributes on top of that. So let me go through uh, a little bit about, about this protein specifically. So all the benefits that you're going to want from a protein, it, it does all those sort of things, but it uniquely does this microbiome balance piece because of those oligosaccharides, because of those prebiotic fibers. Um, so no other protein does that. And that is, for the reasons that I've already said, that is, is a, I mean, that's a core reason for why Amari does things the way Amari does them. We're coming at this mental wellness problem from the perspective of the microbiome and the gut brain axis. So we can't have a protein that damages that. We can't have a protein that goes against that core story. We need a protein that accentuates that and maximizes that and amplifies that. And we were able to find that with this, not just any old chickpea protein, but specifically with this one called Artessa. Artessa it's, it's sourced from North America, Canada and, 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 and the USA. Um, it has those oligosaccharides and it has a really, really good flavor and taste. And the reason for that is the way it's extracted. There are other chickpea proteins out there that taste like chickpeas. They taste like hummus basically. And I don't think anybody wants that. You know, you could make your trade off as, you know, a, a very cheap sort of a protein and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a bad flavor. But the reason we wanted this one is because the way that it's extracted, it's a patented extraction process, low temperature, long duration, that results in, first of all, this, a very, very high biological value plant protein. Something that is right on the level of what a dairy protein would be in terms of overall digestibility, absorbability, transport, and target tissue effect. Those are all the kinds of things that go into, is it gonna have a biological effect in your body? It's not just the amino acids, although that's an important consideration to start with, but is your body gonna digest it? Is your body gonna absorb it? Is your body gonna retain it and not basically spit it back out 
like it's going to with a denatured whey protein, right? So those are all things that most people have no concept of. Um, and, you know, and they'll, they'll wonder why they're pounding down these proteins and they're not getting the effect effects that they want to get. They're not getting the fat loss. They're not getting the muscle building. And what they'll generally think is, oh, I just need to do more. Maybe my body needs more protein, but you're just going to get more of the same. You're going to get more of poor digestion. You're going to get more of spitting it out. You're going to get less of an effect at that target tissue. And so this, this is a really important concept that, that we've already thought through so that you're going to get the best benefits from that protein. The piece that you will notice though, is this this incredible organoleptic profile. Organoleptic profile is, an, is just a way for us to say and measure and then deliver, um, does it taste good? Does it feel good in your mouth? Does it have that creamy consistency? And it does. So here are all the, the attributes of this particular protein, right? It has a good color, so it's not gonna look yellow or weird or off when you open it up. That's a consideration from a, from a consumer standpoint. I mentioned about the small uniform particle size. That's what gives it the creamy consistency in your mouth. And it, and it doesn't taste like sand, like those, those, those non-uniform particle sizes of other plant proteins. Um, uh, you've got uh, excellent water and oil binding. Why is this important? This is important because it doesn't clump up in your, in your smoothie. It mixes easily. Whether you have a, access to a blender or you just have access to a shaker cup. Um, you, you've got high protein you know, levels, 17 grams is nothing to sneeze at. Um, uh, it, 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 this is drop-in replacement for dairy proteins. Some, some companies would, would say, well, I'll combine it with a whey protein and I'll get the best of both worlds. We decided to not do that. Um, and then uh, uh, clean label, because, because of all these attributes, you don't have to mess up your label with all that other garbage, right? Excipients, fillers, sweeteners, flavor maskers, all that kind of stuff. You don't need to do that. You're starting with a really, really clean ingredient that does everything that you want to do, and you don't have to, you don't have to cover it with a, with a lot of other stuff. The downside of this is that it's expensive. Right, so for us to do 17 grams in that sweet spot of functionality and be able to deliver it to you at a cost that makes a lot of sense for people, that was difficult for us to do, but we did. Um, so, so here, you know, there's all these different choices that are out there. We wanted to start with a really, really good raw material, and I think what you'll realize is that at Amare, that's non-negotiable for us, right? Across our entire product line of 19 products right now, you see that in every single product. We're using branded ingredients that have good quality control, that have sustainable sourcing, that have unmatched scientific evidence for those products. And then when we put them together, when you start with good raw materials, if you're a chef, let's say, you wanna start with you know, locally sourced, sustainable, um, highest quality ingredients to put into your recipe. So when you deliver that amazing meal to somebody, they go, wow, that's what we want with our finished products. And you can't do that in the, in the wow manner if, if, you're starting, if you're starting with junky ingredients, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's, that's why we do what we do. Here's how you, can, how, how you compare the organoleptics. I wanna focus you on a couple of things. Here's rice protein, right? And what you're looking at is not good consistency or not good scoring the further out you are on this, on this, um, on this shape, uh, the, the, the higher your attribute is, right? The more, the, more, the more positive your attribute is, the further out you are. Rice protein is not very far out, right? The closer you are to the middle, um, that's, that's yuck. That's terrible. Bad appearance bad taste and flavor, bad texture consistency, bad aroma and smell, bad overall acceptability. You can see that this one is really far in too. Overall acceptability, gross. And you would see the same thing if this were hemp or soy or, or pea protein or you know, anything. So this is, this is rice protein. Um, we use a little bit of this, right? And we, we use just a little bit so that it doesn't mess up all these good scores uh, but it does change our amino acid profile a little bit. Um, here's where whey protein is. This is the standard for taste. This is the standard for flavor and consistency and creaminess and milkshake-like uh, attributes, right? So here's whey, it's in blue, right? Way on the outside, 
very high level scores on all of these, all of these um, di different, different attributes. Here's our Tessa chickpea protein, right? It is virtually superimposable on the whey, right? So, so there, we got the, people are gonna accept it. We got the functionality piece of it in terms of your body using it. Um, and, we, and we got the added benefit of, 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 the, of the microbiome nourishing. So here's another way to look at that. Function, functional profile, sensory profile. It's that idea that I started with several slides ago of saying you have sensory issues and you have functional issues and there's often a trade-off between the two. Not here, right? The trade-off between the two, well, if there's a trade-off, it's cost, right? We get the best sensory profile and the best functionality profile, but it's expensive and we ended up working that in so that, so that it still makes it, still makes it um, affordable for most people. A little bit of brown rice protein, a little bit of pea protein, but not enough to sacrifice on those, on, those, uh, on those different sensory attributes. Okay, so that's why we did the protein the way that we did the protein. I wanna make just a couple of points on how you can make that protein even better as you use it in your life, right? It's one thing for you to say, awesome protein, I'm gonna mix that with water and drink it right down. You would get all those benefits, all those attributes that we talked about before. But what if in that, in that shaker cup, instead of, or um, uh, you know, in that smoothie blender, instead of doing just the protein, now you're adding something else. You're adding your choice of, you know, vanilla almond milk or something like that. Something that you really like the taste of and like the, like the attributes of. What if you could add something like this, like superfood, Put a couple of scoops of superfood in there to boost up your fruit and vegetable servings, right? This is going to be really important for those people who are eating more protein, um, but not eating the carbohydrates, not getting the fruits and vegetable intake. Um, here you're getting three servings of phytonutrients, th well, three phytonutrients equivalent to three servings of fruits and vegetables. You're getting additional nourishment of your gut bacteria for all the benefits there and you're getting anti-stress benefits. That's gonna be really good if you're training to gain muscle mass and if you're training to lose weight. Those are all unique stresses on the body and this product can help you battle back against those stresses, right? So, you know, that's something that some percentage of people who want our protein are also gonna want these attributes and that's why we introduced this at the same time. Fiber, again, fiber, fiber, fiber. Fiber is what's going to be growing that, that healthy microbiome. Um, here's another way that you can do that. Different types of fiber, different types of phytonutrients to grow a very diverse microbiome. Take a couple of scoops of this and throw it into your protein smoothie. And you're going to get an additional benefit on the, on the, the growth of the microbiome, on the integrity of the gut, on the inflammation level in the gut, uh, on the mucus lining in the gut. But then you're also going to get this reduction in stress, tension, and anxiety. You know, so here again, a mental wellness benefit that's coming through, through different mechanisms throughout the gut-brain axis. Um, we can do something like this. We can just say, you know what? I'm gonna take my protein and I wanna really amp up my, my probiotic diversity. Uh, you, can, you can do this. You can add our probiotic product, 10 billion CFUs from a, a variety of different strains. So th this is important just for you to mention briefly, the, the probiotics that we have in our fundamentals are three strains that have been clinically validated for lowering stress, lowering anxiety, lowering depression. Those are specific outcomes of those strains. You'll notice here, these are five different strains that have different range of benefits around general GI function, around digestion, around, um, um, pH of the gut around uh, absorption of nutrients, you know, so those are things that you can use to help you digest and absorb the, the, and, and change the environment of your gut of the, of the foods that you're, um, that you're, that you're taking in the rest of your diet. Our digestive enzyme is another way to do that. So, you know, you're getting a certain amount of protein from our supplement. You're getting a certain amount of protein 
from your chicken breasts and your salmons and your, and your fillets and all that kind of stuff in order for you to digest and absorb and assimilate those proteins at the highest level. You want to make sure you're digesting them the right way. You want to make sure that you're, you have the enzymes to digest those proteins. You want to make sure that you have the right level of GI function and you want to make sure that you have the right amount of gut motility to actually move the food through the stomach where some of the digestion happens, the intestine where most of the digestion and the absorption happens. And so you're not getting too much of an overflow of protein down into the microbiome level because when you do that, like I said, at the very, very top of the, of the, of the hour, if you're getting too much protein metabolism by your microbiome, you're going to be more inflammatory and, and, and less anti-inflammatory, right? So we really want to try to counteract that a little bit by saying, here's the right amount of protein in the right forms, and it's combined with these other ways of nourishing your microbiome with those prebiotic fibers. So you're staying less inflamed, um, uh, which, which is going to be good for your body composition. It's going to be good for your muscle building. It's going to be good for your general health. It's going to be good for your mental wellness. So that is, that's that. That was, that was maybe more information than most people wanted when we're, when we're talking about, you know, specifically about, you know, the question, which was what's the best protein. But I think you get the idea that um, it's a, it's, it's a, it's not quite the easiest answer in the world. There are a lot of considerations that go into that. So I'm going to stop the share on my slides. I'm going to go up here into the chat and see if there are any questions. There's no questions in the chat box right now. Um, and uh, let me see, can you, do, 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 do. okay. Oh, so, so here's a, you know, there is a question here about gout. Um, gout can sometimes be set off by eating too much protein um, the, uh, or, 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 or high protein foods. Um, they're typically not really, it's not really the protein that's causing the problem. It's other compounds in protein containing foods called purines. So if you're eating, you know, oysters are probably the big, the, you know, the big uh, 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 sort of superstar uh, problematic thing. But if you're eating a lot of pork, if you're eating a lot of, you know, any, any sort of rich like organ meats or things like that, uh, if you're drinking a lot of beer, um, which is not high protein, but but can but can lead to changes in this in this puree metabolism can increase your increase your gout levels. One of the greatest ways to reduce your um, your your incidence of gout, you know, in terms of number of flare ups, um, and to reduce your intensity of gout, meaning of those flare ups, they'll be less painful, um, is to improve your gut health. If you improve your gut health. You're going to have all the things I talked about, better microbiome, less inflammation, better gut integrity, better mucus lining, uh, better absorption of things. Um, uh, uh, all of that is going to be beneficial for gout. So instead of saying, um, here's some ways to change the usage of products to be specific for gout, you would do exactly what I just did. You, but you would try to do more plant orientation of your protein intake and less animal orientation of your protein intake. Um, and our GBX protein would be perfect for that. In fact, if I had gout, I would be taking our GBX protein with the superfood, with the seed fiber, with the probiotics, with the digestive enzymes. And I would be doing that as often as possible to help get my gut integrity with our fundamentals to get, our, to get my gut integrity in a good place. And over time, you would see that your, your number of flare-ups and your intensity of flare-ups in that situation would be, would be much improved. Okay, so that's, um, that's, something that, that's something that nobody ever talks about, uh, but like, well, like lots of things. Hardly anybody talks about what we're talking about. We're trying to get people in the best mental health and the best physical health that they possibly can do. And the way to do that is to look at your gut health first get that in line. And then there's all kinds of other things that will, that will cascade from that. So um, anyway, there's no other questions. Does anybody want to unmute themselves and ask a question? I've put you all asleep, it sounds like. All right. No, someone's shaking their head. Okay, good. I'm glad I didn't put everyone to sleep. So that's it. That's the protein show for tonight. I really appreciate you guys joining me. I think next week, the deep dive, I think is open mic night. So um, 
Maybe there'll be something cool in the, in the scientific news I can, I can start the show off with, but bring your questions, bring your people who have questions, bring, bring anybody, bring it all. We're, we're, gonna, we're just gonna have a chit chat next week, okay? So thanks a lot for joining me tonight. I'll post this up in, uh, in just a little while. Take care, you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was very good. All right. My pleasure.